Welcome. I'm Elaine Miller Karish, your host, and this is Resiliency Within. You can also watch us on Facebook Live on Resiliency Within. And my show today highlights the work of two men I greatly respect who've taught me about veterans and their families. They both have a wisdom I wanted to share during this month of November in honor of all veterans and active duty service members. So for those of you listening, thank you for your service if you have served. And I, and I of course, thank you, Mark and Bill for your service. Today's show is entitled Healing the Wounds of War. So veterans, Dr. William Cross and Dr. Mark Dust represent different generations and different wars. They'll share their sacred journey from their service in Vietnam and Iraq to the return and what they learned about life and healing along the way. Let me tell you a little bit about each of them. First of all, Dr. Bill Cross is a practicing psychotherapist in Syracuse, New York, who has worked with military veterans and their families and other people with trauma for over 40 years. He is a West Point graduate and a Vietnam combat veteran, after which he was a professor of psychology and leadership at West Point. After his PhD in counseling from Syracuse University, Dr. Cross taught and became an emeritus professor of psychology at Adenanga, I hope I said that right, Community College. He's a senior faculty and consultant in the trauma resiliency and community, community resiliency models. And now Mark Dust has his PhD. He returned from a tour of duty in Iraq in 2006, and he entered the executive MBA program at the Peter F. Drucker and Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Business at Claremont Graduate University. Upon completing his MBA, he entered the School of Community and Global Health at Claremont Graduate University to complete a PhD in Health Promotion Sciences with a concentration in Neurocognitive Sciences. Mark currently teaches at Cal State Fullerton, where he was awarded the Jeffrey L. Fortuna Outstanding Lecture Award for 2020. He serves on the advisory board of the Trauma Resource Institute and I'd like to welcome both of these wonderful men who I also call my friends. So welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Good to be here with you. So I wanted to start out because we have had, uh, the three of us had, have had many adventures together. Mm -hmm. And I also want to acknowledge your, both of you teaching me so much about veterans and actually being with me from almost the beginning days of starting the Trauma Resource Institute. Um, but also you've been put in situations where the two of you have been roommates at retreats and you've gotten to know each other. And here you are um, from different wars, from different generations. And I was hoping that maybe you'd start out with talking a little bit about um, your relationship with each other and what you've learned from each other in these different situations that you've been in. So let's start with that. And then we have other questions, of course, that we'll, we'll, we'll get into. Mm -hmm. So you want to go first, Bill, or you want me to go first? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> All right. At the core, what I've learned um, is that there really isn't a difference between Bill and I. It doesn't matter what war you served in, what generation you're from, whether you went to West Point or you came in as an enlisted soldier. Um, it doesn't matter if you were Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. We all have the same nervous system. All right, we all process trauma relatively the same way in our bodies. And through that, we have the shared kinship. You know, the, the wars didn't matter. Um, the experiences in war, even though the jungles of Vietnam are not the same as the streets of Baghdad, it's the nervous system still processes it the same way. You know, we have that triad that we talk about. Um, I forget what the new terminology is, but in the beginning, we called it predator prey witness. Um, and that was really helpful in me understanding how war uh, affects the nervous system, you know, and how we're expected to be a predator and a prey at the same time while witnessing um, tragedies of war. And as mammals, we're not equipped to do that. And so it makes total sense that war would disrupt my nervous system, just as it disrupted Bill's nervous system and so everybody else that has served yeah, in those so environments. That, so you saw that even though you were in different wars, some of the experiences that you had within your nervous system in terms of how you responded, and we'll talk more about that, what that means, because I think that's going to be an important part of what you're going to be telling us today. How about you, Bill? What would you say about um, meeting Mark and what you've learned well, it was from each other? It was wonderful when we first met out in California, and I had 
uh, the, the, what I found that really started with Mark is, is recognizing how many of us um, start out with having an experience like war and yet moved into somehow trying to process it, trying to understand it, um, and in a way giving back to uh, the people that have come after us or have gone through this with us and realize that there are some things that we can share about our common experience that really connects us in a way that um, is, is very powerful. And uh, that's something I think that happens with with veterans is that you know we've been through things together and there's a a bond there, but it it it's a bond that's um, has a lot of juice to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say that would be true. And I guess I've seen in both of you your common humanity mm -hmm. that you've been in different wars, and I've seen both of your service to the Trauma Resource Institute, and how I would call you and say, "Hey, I need this, and can you help me with this?" Many times, Mark and I we drove up to the high desert um, and we were doing our initial project, and you know we were we were seeing if this helped, and I mean I think we were excited to see that it did help. And I remember meeting you. Um, um, in Massachusetts, um, Bill too. And, you, you know, it was kind of like that clicking, oh, well, yes, I think this makes sense. And so I, I just remember both of your, your, the spark inside of you wanting to learn something else. Cause I know both of you are schooled in many things, but I always appreciated your openness too, to find out, is there something else that could possibly help not only myself, but the people that I love and care about and the veterans that I am, I continue to serve. So Bill, I have a question for you as we get started. Um, you. So you were a, t a tank unit commander and a combat infantryman in Vietnam. How did you get from there to psychology? Well, it, it's, it, I, I chuckle because I remember the first psychology course I ever had when I was a cadet at West Point, and that was the most boring damn thing I ever went. <laughs> and so, so I sort of bypassed anything at that point. And yet, having gone through Vietnam and being a unit commander, um, subsequently, with a number of folks who had been there and um, then going back to West Point and teaching, um, I recognized that there was a way that psychology could explain and help me process some of the trauma that had ex that I experienced in Vietnam. And there were some things there that um, I felt could be helpful um, to other people as well as to myself, uh, just by learning more about the way um, at that point, our psyches worked, and subsequently um, recognizing the, the way our bodies work, as Mark was talking about earlier. And so I, I recognized that there was some um, way in which I could connect with other veterans, and by doing so, um, help uh, normalize many of my experiences that I thought were unusual, um, but also be able to come out on the other side with some energy that could be giving back to the people that I was working with. I, I think you're saying this well, because I think what we try to do with the community resiliency model that we're going to talk a little bit about today is we try to move from the idea of mental weakness to biology. And I know that you both have shared to me that was really important because when you came back, you, you weren't prepared to how coming back into life again. And I imagine that there are many people that might be listening to this show or family members that are experiencing the same thing, especially with some of the current events as well. So what I'd like to do is, is ask Mark a couple of questions. You know, your bachelor's and master's degree are in business, but what caused the switch to public health for your PhD? Well, I had the fortunate experience of when I was at the Drucker School doing my executive MBA to take a class called Executive Mind. And I didn't really know what it was all about. Um, I just heard that it was you know, a good class to take and that, that I should take it. Um, what I didn't realize was the profound impact it's going to have on my life. Um, it led to my introduction to you. 
um, to try to understanding the nervous system better because I was still, I was diagnosed with PTSD, <clears throat> excuse me, but I didn't really understand what was going on and why I couldn't think through the problems and uh, the group therapy that I was getting at the VA. Why was I leaving there more upset or, or angry than when I went in? Um, what is the medications they're giving me? What is those supposed to do? You know, I didn't understand any of that stuff. But anyhow, I learned um, mindfulness meditation in this course to help regulate my nervous system to make better business decisions. And that's what the course is designed for is, is executives to make decisions based off of logic and reason, not off of impulse and emotion. And so I saw my life start to change when I became more aware of what's going on in my body. What's that tingly sensation in my chest mean? Um, you know, those kinds of things. And I just became fascinated with the whole brain body connection, how the nervous system works. And then um, when I discovered that the brain doesn't know the difference between you telling a story and it actually happening, that gave me the idea of, well, if I'm getting upset telling my story and, um, you know, about my experiences in Iraq and group therapies and things of that nature, once I learned the, the resilience or not the resilience, I'm sorry, the resourcing skill. And I started focusing on resourcing and going, Oh, I feel better after that. What's going on here. <laughs> um, and that's what really flipped me from business to go into public health. And I chose public health because I still felt like psychology was siloed in just treating thoughts and memories, emotions, that kind of stuff. Medical field was siloed in let's treat the symptoms. Here's more medication. Let's throw it at it. But public health comes from a prevention aspect. What can we do before you get exposed to a traumatic event that could possibly help reduce the impact uh, on the nervous system and, you know, and even just everyday life? Can we go through life a little bit more resilient um, to those stressors that we impact every day? And so I had to know um, Jeremy Hunter, Dr. Jeremy Hunter is, is the one that that uh, taught the class and introduced us as well. Um, you know, he said, if you want to do a PhD, that's, that's fine, but don't do it unless you have a question that you absolutely have to have answered before you die. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's a pretty strong one. <laughs> that's and so a pretty I strong had, one, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I had to know, can you exercise the nervous system like you do your muscles and your heart in order to possibly stave off the effects of, um, a traumatic event turning into PTSD. Can you build your body up beforehand? And so that's and what so I did my And PhD so what's on. your answer? I just want to, I mean, I don't want to take away your thunder. You're going to come back and talk to more about that because that's a very important, the answer to that. So maybe I can ask you to hold off to the answer till we Will get do. to a, another question. Um, but I also just had a spark of memory of sitting with you at the soup plantation over lunch, teaching you the basic skills of the community resiliency model. Yep. I mean, it was like an hour lunch. And so I want you all to know that it doesn't have to take a long time to learn some basic skills that could maybe change the trajectory of your life. I mean, that's, I mean, that sounds kind of almost strange to say, but I know that it has happened. So I still remember, you remember that lunch? I think I, you might. I do. Yes. I do. So that brings me over to Bill. Bill, you've studied, I mean, you're, you're a you know, psychologist, you've studied prolonged exposure therapy, you're a somatic experiencing practitioner. What drew you to the Trauma Resource Institute and to the Community Resiliency Model? What was it about that that, you know, got your attention? Well, my initial training was uh, in Rogerian therapy uh, and my PhD program and sort of a humanistic approach to working with folks. And realized in the process of doing that, that there was a lot more that was going on here that, that this therapy that I was trained to do was missing. And um, it was after my PhD that PTSD became uh, acknowledged as a disorder. Um, and so I got early on just listening to people, helping people talk about what had happened with them. But that really didn't touch at all for me and for the folks that I was working with um, until I began recognizing that the body really was playing a part of this. And I was, my wife was involved in yoga. And so, I, you know, I realized, you know, there's some things that happened after I was doing yoga that, you know, was <laughs> helping me feel better. 
Um, so then I heard about um, somatic experiencing um, and had gotten involved uh, with the somatic experiencing process um, and uh, went to this first real uh, training that I had. And fortunately, as I was listening to this, um, in the same class was Lois Bass. Yeah, who, dear Lois. Uh, who was very much involved with what you were doing. And yes. she said, you know, Bill, if you really want to do this stuff, you really ought to talk to Elaine and uh, find out what she's doing. So um, that sort of sparked my interest and recognized that, um, first of all, the um, prolonged exposure therapy, which I'd gotten involved with in the University of Pennsylvania, um, was working with specific um, forms of trauma that seemed to be effective with single incidents, um, and uh, it was helpful for, for, for some, but it was really triggering an awful lot of the people that I was working with who had had um, more uh, what we may have called developmental um, trauma or prolonged or, or cumulative trauma. <clears throat> uh, that was triggering more than it was helping. And so then the, the somatic experiencing process that I got involved with was something that I found very effective. Um, however, it was a very, it was a three-year program. It was uh, extensive in terms of our, my time, but also expensive. And um, it was something that um, I wanted to have something a, could work more immediately with folks. And that's when Lois said, talk with Elaine and find out those skills. And I realized that what you had been presenting, Elaine, was something that involves skills that were trainable, that were teachable, that people could get rather readily um, and learn to regulate their nervous system in a way that was very helpful uh, for me. Um, and when it started being helpful for me, I was passing it along with the veterans that I was working with and finding that that, that was a ticket that really was helpful. So, yeah. So it really was accessibility and I guess affordability, because I think that was one of my initial intentions when I first learned about the body through also somatic experiencing. I thought, oh, this is, everybody needs to know this. And I, you know, what Mark was talking about, everybody has a nervous system, you know, that's, that is a, um, really just, it's a simple statement, but that is also is our common humanity. And we all have the same nervous system that operates the same way after trauma, whether we live in the United States or Nepal or um, Tanzania or Rwanda. And when that kind of flash bulb went inside of me, it was like, it has to be in the water if we can make it that way. So I think that's one of the things we tried to do with training natural leaders of communities. But I also want to say, you know, Bill, you've been such a partner in realizing that and helping to develop the beginnings of coming up to Syracuse, getting your people up there, getting people trained in, as scrim teachers as we were developing the program. Mm -hmm. So it was a process, not always an easy one, as we both know, but it was a process that I appreciate your, your stick to mm -hmm. of helping to, to spark that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you know, you're in, so in my heart when I'm just remembering that as well, but I want to come back to Mark and because Mark, how did the, the crim skills compare the treatment you received through the VA? Now you had some of the treatments that, is there anything, and, and I don't want to say, you know, I, I really respect the veterans administration. I'm not saying that there aren't many modalities and approaches that have, have been helpful through there. So I want to just kind of couch that in and still mm -hmm. it's nice to have something else. So go ahead and give us your impressions. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. The VA is doing the best with what they have. And it's a bureaucratic system that takes a long time for things to make change. They're working off of, you know, evidence-based approaches and, and things of that nature. Um, and so it, it takes time. So, you know, say so they're doing the best they can with what they've got. All right. But it wasn't effective for me. You know, I was doing group therapy sessions and it was, it, it was difficult um, to sit there because 
with the retelling stories and just talking about how to processing and that kind of stuff. And eventually I did do cognitive behavioral therapy, but it wasn't until after I'd already learned the CRIM skills, because I don't think I would have been successful in CBT without being able to regulate my nervous system. Because once I learned that that tingling sensation coming up in my chest was just my nervous system trying to warn me like, Hey, something's going on here. Be alert, be alert. I go like, okay, cool. I know what that is. And I can ground myself, shift my attention to another part of my body until things start to calm down. And then I can process using the cognitive models of CBT to reframe the situation, what happened. But prior to that, I would get so activated. And this is one of the key things that I learned um, uh, through CRAM as well is that once my my nervous system is triggered, I'm in a flight or flight response, I can't use that front part of my brain, all right? Cortisol chemically uh, reduces my ability to think because in a life or death situation, we need to respond and react. We don't need to be doing calculus and you know <laughs> projecting out into the future, what's gonna be happening if I do this kind of thing. It's an immediate response type of deal. Otherwise we wouldn't stay alive as human beings. So once I learned that, I was like, oh, okay, if I need to do logic and reason to process this, if I notice things start to come up, let's keep that activation level down and then I can do the talk therapy side of it. And I think that's one of the key missing ingredients with traditional psychotherapy is there's very little attention, if any, paid to the body, you know, and to the nervous system itself. And then if I need to use the part of my brain that talk therapy is designed to affect, and I'm in a fight or flight state, I can't. So therefore, the therapy is not going to be as effective. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, it might take longer, that kind of thing. Um, but that that was kind of my, my, it was like an that, aha moment, wasn't it? To yeah, realize that. And I just really want to, I want to just, you know, emphasize that we have learned that from so many veterans and other people who've experienced other kinds of trauma, that as long as your survival responses are being sparked, it is really hard to use those cognitive prefrontal cortex to, to have meaning about what's going on because yep. it's, we're designed for survival. But I'm going to just um, see if Bill wants to respond or add to anything that Mark has said, because I know that's been the core of some of our conversations, Bill, is what Mark is talking about. Yeah, really. It's, um, and I'm glad you brought that up. I actually was uh, this morning working with a, um, he wasn't a vet, he's a um, first responder, he, uh, Syracuse police uh, by the way, Lane and I had trained uh, the uh, peer support team of Lane, the Syracuse Police Department a number of years ago. This young man had been involved in a very uh, difficult situation with a, um, a woman who had, uh, was a, attacking him with a knife and um, he, had, he had to use his weapon as a way of uh, being able to um, resolve the, the situation and unfortunately the woman died oh this was a traumatic experience for him and this morning this was the second time i worked with him the first time i had taught him uh, just this whole you know the basic kind of stuff of tracking you know turning attention to your body and being able to get yourself more calm by grounding and resourcing I, those are the three that i got that first time he, he hooked into the grounding. And this morning we started talking and I, I had talked with him about the idea that we were going to process that event with him today. And so I asked him, so what are you noticing right now? And he said, well, I'm really kind of amped up and, um, you know, I'm really, I know we're going to talk about this. I'm really kind of amped up. And I said, so what do you want to want to do right now? And he said, well, I know what I am doing right now is that I'm aware of my body in this chair, like you taught me about being grounded. Yes. And I said, all right, just let yourself hang out with that. And he did. And, and as we went through the sequence, this was a, a historical process of going through the sequence of the events, I noticed as he talked, you know, he could get a little bit amped up and I you know, we talk about resiliency pauses and he said, okay, so notice what's going on right now. And he said, you know, what I'm aware of is that what you taught me is something that's very natural. <laughs> and, and this is, this is going, he said, you know, it, it's happened since the last time we talked and I found myself just noticing myself in the chair and I, and I felt more comfortable and I could. And so, you know, this was something. You know, Very simple. Uh, 
second time. Second time. Stuff, yeah. And it was something that was he was able to connect with very directly. And um, anyway, so it, we we worked through this in a way that um, he was able to get through the events and, and keep himself calm at the end. And uh, it, it was just remarkable how that works. Yeah. So I'm just going to just also I want to just emphasize here for people that are listening to this. You know, this is what we call present moment awareness is that using these, these very simple strategies and bringing attention to sensations connected to sitting in the chair. When you have present moment awareness, you're not really thinking of the past or the future, you're just there. And that also helps with the prefrontal cortex being online to be able to continue the conversation. But to have this skill, and I think this is something that I've heard from many veterans that they can use for themselves anytime, not when they're just in the therapy office. And Mark, I'm going to come back to you after the break, because I'm going to invite you to tell that story about your family's ride to Disneyland, Mm -hmm. because I mean, I, that was one of the most powerful conversations I can ever remember with a veteran, because it certainly shifted my perspective of just how much we had to, you know, get this into as many people's hands as possible. I don't know. I think it probably did a little for you too, as you have told me about that. And we've, you've shared that many times with me when we've done presentations together. But um, so I want all of our listeners to know that Mark and Bill are going to be back after our break, and they're going to talk a little bit more about some of the the elements. And I told you, too, that we could probably do a show for three hours and we wouldn't get everything in that we wanted to. But, you know, there's there's other shows in in the future. And there's also there's continuation after the break. So when we come back, they're both going to talk us a little bit more about their experience. And I'm going to ask um. Bill to do a kind of a deeper dive into the, cause he's a psychotherapist about some of his impressions about working with veterans from different wars, for example. And also I think he has some perspectives about what just happened in Afghanistan. And we may have listeners right now that maybe have come back from Afghanistan. And I know there's been a lot of heartache, um, not only with coming out, but who's left there, especially I've heard a lot about the translators that were lifelines and, um, kind of this, almost the guilt of not being able to do more for them. And I don't know if you've um, had any experience with that bill, but we can all, we can discuss that together. So we will be back in just a few moments with, with um, Dr. Bill Cross and Dr. Mark Dust, where they will continue to tell us a little bit more about how to heal the wounds of war. All right. Excellent segment. All clear. Okay. Thank you, Matt. No, we're still on um, Facebook Live. Just want you to know. So we've got a couple minutes before we'll get back on. on and I, oh my gosh, you two, I do have to have you on again. I know I'm going to have to because I think we're just touching the surface right now. Barely <laughs> scratching we, it. Yes, we're scratching it. But anyway, thank you so much, both of you. I think you're just illuminating from the way that you both are, you know, bringing this forward, how important this is um, to everyone who's listening, who is a veteran a family member, a veteran, and may feel like they don't know what to do. Because as much as I would like to say that the community resiliency model, I would love it in every VA in the country, it isn't yet. But that doesn't mean it won't be. Um, So it's just, as you said, Mark, it's a matter of time, because Mm -hmm. we need to have more of the evidence base. But I think we're getting closer to having that happen. Yeah. And um, Kim Freeman and the group at Loma Linda are in the process of the project that um, uh, Mark worked on, the Veterans Extension Project with Jan Click, they're in the process of, of having that published. And actually they just published the first arm of that, of the, um, the, um, the first part that just got published in the Journal of Community Health um, that gives the outcome of that. So we're really excited that that work is getting out there. Yeah. Um, even though it wasn't, they, we didn't have a randomized control trial, but that's what you do in the beginning. You have mm-hmm. to get a lot of information before you can get to that point of having randomized control trials. So exciting. It, it is. Bill, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, no, I, I, well, yeah. <laughs> a lot probably you want to say. A yes. lot to say. Um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I get really um, juiced up thinking about what. Um, uh, the effectiveness of this work and how um, many people are are really um, benefiting from it all, and and particularly, you know, the, you talk about families and how 
veterans um, certainly have their own experience with it all, but families went through it and go through it as well. And yes. this whole process of uh, working with veterans, I found really amplified by working with families of veterans, spouses, um, as well as the kids. Um, you know, I, I found many of the kids who um, learn these skills that, you know, they're able to talk to their folks and say, you know, you guys are out of your zone right now. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> and, so true. And, and that, that's a good reminder. And so, you know, bringing the family involved in this is something really helpful as well. So, that's so um, I, we're about to come back. So I'm going to ask you about that bill when we come back. I think that would okay. be a, a good thing to add in addition, because we didn't really have that in our questions, but I'm going to add that to it. Okay. All right. Okay, here we go. This is Resiliency Within with Elaine Miller Karras. To reach the show during our live broadcast, please call in to 1 866 472 5792. That's 1 866 472 5792. You may also send an email to Elaine at resiliencywithin.com. Now, back to this week's show. Welcome back. I am with Dr. Mark Dust and Dr. Bill Cross. We're talking about healing the wounds of war. And as we were, we were talking a little bit at the break that we want to bring this to the, to the show, we we're talking about families. And Bill, would you like to say a little bit about what you've learned? And then Mark, I know you have had a bunch of kids that were there at the house when you, ca when you came back from war. And so we'll talk about that as well. So Bill, go ahead. Why don't you start? Well, I, I just was saying that, that in working with veterans, I find that um, the work can really be amplified by having members of the family um, go through the experience of learning these skills as well. And not just spouses uh, who have obviously really it probably experienced the way in which the post-traumatic stress has affected the vets most directly, but the kids as well. And I find that the kids are able to uh, get the message very quickly about the resilience zone and about um, noticing when their parents get out of it. So it's, I think it helps them recognize themselves that, look, mom and dad keep sort of wiggy over here and they get all upset and whatever. And sometimes if I can, I just say, you know, you guys are out of your resilience zone. I've had, that's, that's something that, that some of the kids have said, and it, has the family really connect with what might be necessary in order to be able to get more in your resilience zone. So and it it gives them a common language, right? I think that's yeah, so important absolutely. in how to talk to one another. So um, I, I'm going to turn this over now to Mark, because I remember, Mark, you telling me that when you came back from Iraq, that, you know, that your fuse was not the same when it came mm, to your kids. You Can you let us know a little bit about that and what and what helped you? Yeah, I had a fuse probably about a half a millimeter long, I think. Um, and that was one of the things that actually really scared me the most was I was afraid that I was going to snap and hurt one of my kids. If it was to go beyond me just yelling or uh, things of that nature, I was worried about it turning physical. Um, my kids, like my youngest, who is 17 now, was six months old when I deployed. So when I got home, he was barely two um, kind of thing. And, you know, two-year-olds can be a little bit of a handful. Um, you know, and then my middle son was three, four years older. So he was six. Then my daughter was three years old. So she was about 10, uh, nine, 10 years old, somewhere around that age. And so having three kids causing a ruckus and just being kids would fry my nerves, essentially, you know, whatever I had left, um, kind of thing. And so I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to control myself, uh, really. And that's what first drove me to seek help for PTSD, because I didn't know I had it at the time, because, you know, the military is very insular. Um, and it's very protective of, uh, you know, mental health and not exposing, thinking that you're weak, or you're broken, and that kind of stuff. It's, it's still prevalent in the military, no matter how much it comes down from the top, trying to 
to do um, mental health and well-being and those kinds of things. It doesn't always stick, especially in the combat arms side of things, at least my experience, because, you know, you're supposed to be hard and tough and, um, you know, you go into combat and, and possibly kill people. That's your job um, in, in, in the infantry. Um, and so I was, I, again, that, that's what really worried me the most. Um, and now that I learned and I got past it and, and, you know, I think the kids are, are growing up relatively well adjusted kind of thing. But what concerns me the most, I think, is the research that's coming out about how your DNA is affected um, with PTSD uh, and even traumatic just events and not having PTSD, but your DNA gets changed and your children can inherit those genes and they could be born possibly having difficulties with processing emotions and processing and, and just responding to stress. They're, they're basically their stress regulation system is already dysfunctional when they're born. Uh, and so if we don't start to have these skills and teaching these skills to people and them using themselves and then within families, sharing that language, understanding when they're getting knocked outside their resilient zone, um, we may possibly be having, you know, children that are dysfunctional um, in our schools and, and elsewhere that could benefit from their parents prior to conception, having training in regulating their nervous learning system. Learning how to calm their nervous system. Exactly. So exactly. Learning I to... remember you telling me about one event when you were on your way to Disneyland, you had just come back and um, you were driving down the road and, but you had learned the skills, you had learned the skills and you did something differently. And so can you share a little bit about, about that? Well, actually the first experience was before I learned the oh, skills. Oh, that's right. I was, I was still that's in the That's what Army. scared you. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so I was stationed at Fort Irwin, um, middle of the Mojave Desert. It's the National Training Center in California where all the units come to train before they deployed. Um, and so I was driving down Interstate 15 going towards Anaheim to Disneyland. Wife and kids love Disneyland. I tolerated it. Uh, I would... Well, I'll, I'll get off track there. But anyhow, the story is that we were driving down the road. There was a pile of trash on the side of the road. And I reacted without thinking as if it was an IED because I was blown up in Iraq by a road sign and it was facing the wrong direction. And that my one trial learning of that event, my brain said, hey, anything on the side of the road is a threat because, you know, they would bury IEDs and in, in trash and dead animals. And it wasn't just the road sign, but your, your nervous system expands, your amygdala expands that memory to say everything could be a threat or right? you become hypervigilant for it. And so what I didn't realize is that I had this pre-programmed um, uh, uh, program essentially to run in my body that says, you see this, if this, then that, you know, an old basic type programming. So I stepped on the gas, swerved and accelerated out of the kill zone. I wasn't cognitively aware. I was in a Honda Odyssey minivan in Southern California with my wife and three kids on the way to Disneyland. My nervous system said threat. This is what you do react before I could even think about it. And I'm like, where did that come from? And I was like, okay, there's, we got some issues here. It's not just anger, but it's this other stuff. You know, I, I couldn't go into a restaurant without having my back against the wall. You know, we had to sit somewhere away from other people where I could scan the whole perimeter, preferably looking out the windows, looking for threats. I'm going, what is going on here? This makes no sense. I know I'm not going to get shot at. I'm not going to get blown up. Nobody's going to be a suicide bomber coming in this door, but I can't get out of it. I that thought process is going on in my mind. Um, and it wasn't until I learned the skills and some of the psychoeducation of understanding that it's my biology that's messed up, not me, that helped me to understand what was going on. And once I understood what was going on, then I had the power to say, oh, okay, I can do something about this. And that was the crim skills. What and really so can I just say that. about your biology, which actually doing what it was supposed to do. It's supposed right. to tell you when you're, you're possibly, uh, your life is threatened. And so what it does, your amygdala, which is your threat appraiser, said any garbage on the side of the road could be an IED. Now, that's yep. not conscious thinking. That's survival brain. Right. And so, but once you learn that information, then the, so after you learned about how you could um, help your nervous system, then what would happen then when you'd see trash on the side of the road? Tell us that would, part of the story. Yeah. 
once I learned grounding and shift and stay two of the crim skills, I would notice and even as I'm talking about it right now, I just got a little chill that ran up through my body because I'm remembering that story. Remember, I said earlier, the brain doesn't know the difference um, between it happening and you thinking about it. But now I know what that little chill is all about. And like, okay, not a big deal. But what I would notice is, um, you know, this, this tingly sensation moving up in my chest. And then that was a cue for me to say, Oh, okay, that's a signal. All right, I may not even realize yet that there was trash on the side of the road. But then I would shift my attention to the steering wheel, all right, and try to get all the tactile sensation of the leather or the stitching or uh, I would shift my attention to my butt in the seat, or my back against it or the, anything that would put me in the present moment. And that's where the power in this and in, in it really lies is it gets my brain out of that thinking of, here's this movie that this is what could happen. If I can't access that movie, because I'm thinking so much about paying attention to the steering wheel, the temperature of it, the texture, all these kinds of things that put my attention to it, it keeps me in the present moment, I can shift my attention to another part of my body that feels just a little bit better where that tingly sensation isn't until it subsides, because your brain's not a good multitasker. And so you intercept that hijacking of the nervous right. system at that moment, and then you're back in the present moment. And then you can go by that garbage and it didn't cause the same reaction. And right. even it, it the, took time. It, to, I remember to get you. Through it. Yeah. I remember yeah. you telling me that it took a number of, of times to practice before yeah, it really settled. I think in. overall it took about six months, but I, I would also kind of do my own thing where I would practice bringing that memory up in mind and I could see the trash on the side of the road. I get closer to it. Um, and this is more in the trim skills of, of, titration uh, and pendulation, but I, I could basically kind of do my own mini exposure therapy type of thing mentally of getting myself closer to it and then noticing the reaction in my body shift to my resource until things kind of come down. And then I could also resource before that to kind of prime my system to do the work as I was going through that, that mental movie uh, type of thing. But yeah, it was, it was life-changing. Really. And so I'm just going to want to say that these are skills that you could use for yourself when you were yep. doing your activities of daily living, which is what can be so hard that kind of derails your life when you come back from war. I want to kind of, kind of change the direction a little bit and talk a little bit to, to, uh, to Bill. Um, you know, you have, you have uh, treated people from different wars. Can you give us any, um, you know, insights about, you know, what, how, how is it different? How is it the same? Are there any things that you think might be helpful for our listeners to know? If you're a Vietnam veteran, how does, is that different from an Iraq veteran or Gulf War or Korean War? Yeah, well, generally what I've found is that it's really, we're, we're veterans, we've been in war. And um, I've worked with World War II vets, Korean War vets, Vietnam vets, Gulf War vets, Iraq, Afghanistan, all of them. And uh, the, the common denominator there is that we've, we've been in traumatic situations. And what I've found is that um, many of the vets have a perspective of what's happened at, with other, other wars. And I know a, a number of the uh, Iraqi and Afghan, the more the younger vets say, "Well, now, you know, you were in Vietnam, and and, and that that was really difficult. You had so much more difficulty than than I did." And and I say, "No, guys, come on. Uh, realize that that your experience is it, it, the trauma that you experience is the same kind of stuff that I experienced. That people in Korea experience, that people in World War II experience. It's different." There's, you know, qualitative differences, but your body is still reacting in the same way. And it, it's something I think that, um, you know, that they talk about how, um, well, you, when you guys came back from Vietnam, you know, you were not accepted by the, the, the culture, the way we are accepted here now. And I said, okay, that's, that's one thing. And recognize that um, our experience over there largely was uh, one tour, um, and then we were we were back for for many of us. Some of us had two or three tours, but most of us were just one tour. And look at what you've experienced as overall. Yes, many tours. Yeah. Five, six tours. All right. 
So there's differences, but your body is still reacting in the same kind of way. And um, it's important to realize that, you, you know, you've you got to take care of yourself and really just appreciate our commonality. And, and have you seen people be able to shift their perspective and seeing that? Yeah, you know, I, people- I have. And just, just acknowledging that, you know, and, yeah. and, and using that terminology of our, our bodies being the same. And, and you know, um, and I'm even veterans who have not been in war. You know, there, there's trauma that people experience um, all over. And it's the same kind of stuff with our bodies. And um, that- I Well, think- I, I'm glad you brought that up because I've heard that people say, well, I have trauma, but I didn't go to war. So it's not, it's not really legitimate trauma, mm-hmm. right? And which is of course not true. No, you know, and, and you know, there's been recently stuff talk about moral injury, right? Well, okay, if you are trained uh, you know, in the, in the military w- with the bayonet, all right? So the, 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 the line was, uh, what's the spirit of the bayonet? The spirit of the bayonet is to kill, right? So if your moral values, which is, happens for most of us, is not to kill others, and you're taught to kill other people, that's, that's an injury to your moral fiber that deeply held. And although it may not uh, seem to be as dramatic as actually killing someone or watching someone be killed or be wounded yourself, it still is an injury to your system and, and your body is reacting to that. Yeah. So, and, I, and I think the body's reaction is so important, whether you were in war or not, which kind of brings me to the next question. I'm going to go over to Mark. Um, your dissertation research was on building resilience towards traumatic stress. And that's what we're talking about, traumatic stress. Um, what did you find? Well, I, I found that you know resourcing is quite powerful. You know, being able to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which you know we refer to as the rest and digest, it's the the antagonist to the fight or flight from your sympathetic nervous system, but it doesn't come online immediately like our fight or flight response does. And in PTSD, sometimes it doesn't ever come back on at all. You know, you get stuck in this in this loop uh, of reactivity. And I found that by consciously activating it, by exercising our nervous system, like we do our, our heart or our muscles, as I said earlier, you can actually build some physiological resilience. Um, you know, I, the only unfortunate part of it is my sample size wasn't quite big enough. I was limited on funds. Uh, and so I didn't quite have enough people to detect a statistically significant difference between my control group and my treatment groups on the physiological measures. But we, we did see some evidence of um, those in the treatment group that learned the, the resourcing skill and practiced that for a week were when they watched the videos, um, my stimulus was skydiving accidents, war videos and things of that nature to, to amp up their nervous system and healthy individuals. Um, <clears throat> we found a little less reactivity in the sympathetic arousal in the treatment group. So in other words, they didn't get as amped up watching the videos as the uh, control group did. And so what that is telling me is that there's a possibility of building physiological resilience to where, yeah, we'll still get amped up, but not so high that we get thrown into a, um, uh, an irrecoverable spin kind of thing where our nervous system gets dysregulated to the point where it can't get back in into regulation on its own and, and PTSD develops from that. Um, we also found that those that practice the resourcing skill were able to return their physiology to baseline faster than those that didn't than the control group. Um, and what that could indicate is that If you have these skills and you know how to recognize that your nervous system is getting amped up, if you can reduce your uh, physiological uh, activity after the event has occurred, you're much less likely to develop PTSD than somebody who did not process it and let it just continue on kind of thing. So it was really, really promising research. Uh, I need to get funding for bigger studies. kind of thing, but it, that's that's what I found. And also in the depression, anxiety, and stress scores, those all uh, did have statistically significant differences in reduction between the treatment group and the control group. 
Well, I mean, it's very promising. And I always have so much appreciation for you to do that because I think it was the first study of its kind that was done on CRIM, even though it was a small sample size. I mean, you have to start somewhere. So Mark, um, and I know that it, it seemed to make a big difference for you to, to do that research. And of course, I guess that led to your PhD, which of course makes me so happy to even say that yeah. out loud. And answered and that question I had to have before I died. <laughs> that's your, that's right. What Dr. Hunter had suggested, right? Well, yeah. I want to ask you, um, kind of loop back to something you both said in the beginning. And, you know, we kind of, we actually talk about this paradigm of the aggressor, um, the prey and the witness. And if, I know that you mentioned it, Mark, and I don't know if you would like to say something more about that bill, if you think that, because it's kind of the perfect storm of the nervous system, I think is what we had come to. So if you could say something to it, and then maybe Mark wants to say something else. Right. Uh, well, I think the way I, I see that more evident is that uh, for many people who have been uh, not so much involved with the trauma, but witnessed the trauma in some way, um, either directly or indirectly, um, that that is something that really um, is triggering as well. And those of us who have been in situations where we are, are predator and uh, victim and witness, that it really affects us in a number of different ways. And um, it is the perfect storm. And it's something I think that, um, you know, many people can really see. Um, uh, I know that I, I work a number of people who are not only veterans, but continue to work uh, as first responders, uh, that, that they are still involved with this and that, um, you know, that they, they see the, uh, the trauma that's occurring. They uh, are in the process of trying to uh, resolve an issue and may become the perpetrator in a way, uh, and as well may have been on the other side of somebody uh, attacking them in a, in a in a violent way. And so in all three of those things are occurring at the same time, and it's very triggering. And um, I found that being able to um, explore all three of those separately uh, can help people recognize that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I remember, thank you so much, Bill, for that. I'm Mark, I remember one time we were work, uh, you came along with me, there were a lot of fancy people in that room that were the leading experts on post-traumatic stress disorder in the country on veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them took exception to this paradigm and you had a strong reaction. And uh, I guess you could say, I think you described yourself. I was the only grunt in the room and I let they needed to let them know my, my, so uh, a parting thought where we're running out of time. I, I knew this would happen. So what is your parting thought that you would like to leave our listeners with, you know, with that kind of introduction of, this idea? Um, my parting thoughts a little bit off of that topic, but it still pertains is that there's nothing wrong with you, the individual, it's your biology. All right. If you can understand that your, your biology is what's dysregulated that leads to the behaviors that you don't like, then you can separate mark the person from the behavior that the biology is driving because it changes your, your nervous system can drive your thoughts, your thoughts can drive your nervous system. And you can rec if once you recognize that, then you're much better equipped to go through your activities of daily living and return your life to some semblance of normality where you're in control, you're not reacting to everything. And that's where you know the aggressor prey witness thing is, our eyes are in the front of our heads. Prey animals, their eyes are on the side of their heads. Our nervous systems are wired to, to look at threats differently. And when you're traveling down the streets of Baghdad, sticking up out of the top of a Humvee like I was, I'm all three at the same time. And your nervous system isn't equipped to handle that. All right. Imagine you were never went outside the wire. You're the prey, but you're an right. aggressor. Right. And so it, it's just total, it makes, just makes total sense that makes you can be dysregulated. Total sense. And I want to say that all those people there agreed with you after you gave that description. And, and I'm going to give you the final word, Bill. We had just a couple of minutes left. So if there can something that you would want to say with all your wisdom of age and, oh my goodness, you're such a sage. Oh. Parting thought. Uh, well, uh, a very uh, close friend asked me a number of years ago when I was giving an address to a, a, a theater of people, uh, what can we do with veterans? How can we help veterans? And I said, 
one word, listen. Listen. Right? And uh, he said, well, so what do you mean? I said, well, veterans have a lot to, to express. They have a lot of wisdom. They have a lot of life that they've been through, a very full life. And if you can just allow yourself to listen to it, not try to make anything happen, but just to listen, that can be really very helpful for them. And for veterans, I want to say this, it's important for you to be able to express it. So expressing able, it and listening. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, so to have to listen to veterans, but also to be able to express what's going on inside. on inside. And so not, uh, uh, not be reluctant to do that. Yeah. So I just want to we, we need to end now. I'm going to have you both on again, obviously, um, since there's I think we got through half of our questions. Um, but I want to thank you both for your service. Thank you for your time. Um, people can go to the Voice America um, site to see how they could get in touch with you if they would like to, um, to find out and talk more to you both. And you could also reach me at Elaine at resiliencywithin.com and I can connect you with both um, Dr. Dust and Dr. Cross. Again, thank you so much, you two. I, you know that My I love pleasure. you both. And, um, and we and, love you. Yes, and thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom. And I imagine there are many listeners here that are going to take home, especially as we come through the holidays. Um, these were important words about not only listening, but don't be afraid to share your feelings and go and learn I chill the crim skills and, and, and start using them right away. And uh, it, they can really help you. So yep. blessings to all of our listeners. And I think you can see from both of these gentlemen that they are living examples of what else is true, that they've both suffered and yet they have turned their lives around in, play, in ways of service to others and um, great gratitude and, and a bow to both of you. Thank you so much. Until Thanks next time. Me. Thank you. All right. Awesome job today, everyone. All clear. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you two, we're still on our Facebook Live. I haven't disconnected. So I know we, I mean, oh my goodness, we, we uh, literally, we could have gone on for another hour or more. So right. we'll, we'll have to figure out if you're willing to come back again, maybe next year. And we can do another, another, another part two, because I feel we really did just scratch the surface. Okay. So uh, anyway, thank you both. I mean, oh my goodness, you both are so wise. Well, we have a good model in you. <laughs> yes, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. So I don't know if you, if you want to say anything more, because we do have more time with our Facebook live listeners. If you, there's anything more that you thought, oh, I wanted to say this and didn't get a chance to. My only uh, addition is that, you know, the crim skills are durable. You know, it, they're so easy to learn and you don't have to be a mental health professional to learn them and apply them. Uh, I've used stealth criming with my students uh you know they're sitting in my office and they're stressing and i can get them just notice their feet on the floor and like oh oh yeah okay <laughs> you know and you just it's a, such flip. a nice life skill isn't it we all use them all the time i mean it is yeah. i use them we, and we do and you know and the thing that that mark had mentioned just he, she you mentioned while we were talking there at a time something came up and you were aware of the 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 cold coming through you. I, I wanted to say how this is stuff that we have to continue to do. This isn't something that goes away. We 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 get triggered. Um, I was you know over Thanksgiving we we were in a, a a group of people and at the party and somebody dropped a, a bunch of plates behind me and I jumped and I I got triggered and. Yet the skills just like connecting helped you come back, just coming back, but just noticing it, it's it's something that is easily learned and it's something that is ongoing. That you know, just because you get triggered doesn't mean that you're that, that well, you got to go back to square one. Well, you know, and I love that, I think we should do a show on that. Because mm -hmm. I think that's about, okay, now you know skills, then how do you go about the activities of daily living knowing that is there's nothing wrong with the fact that your body had that reaction, right? That's not maladaptive. That's really an adaptive function of our nervous system, but you're no longer in danger. And, and then, and the amygdala can't discern that difference, but you can, because, mm -hmm. because 
CRIM is about not just what we sense, it's what we think and what we feel. And right. then you use your cognitive processing to say, oh, no, that's just dishes. Oh, I can ground myself. I can pull in a skill and then I can come back because I've had people tell me, and I don't know if you two have had this experience that it would take them like a week to get back into their resilient zone mm -hmm. after something like that happened, like hearing, you know, something that reminded them of war. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one of the things that was really life-changing for some is that they could do something so quickly to come back into that zone and be back to themselves again. And I think that in and of itself, we should, you know, try to talk more about, we don't talk about that as much as we could. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a, definitely a whole episode. That could be a whole episode. And I think we need to do it. So and then how you can take those skills that you've practiced on yourself and then apply them to others. Cause you know, I mentioned in the, the questions that uh, just recently, my son was involved in a car accident and I could notice um, because I was tracking his nervous system over the phone, mm -hmm. um, walking him through, okay, let's get all this stuff filled out. And then I noticed he started to kind of break down a little bit and I was able to use the skills to get him to let out the parasympathetic discharge mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the event was over. And then I had a student waiting to see me and heard the whole conversation. She was crying because she had had a traumatic experience like that um, oh not gosh. too long ago as well. And so then I had to sh uh, shift from the phone to the student right then and there and get her nervous system um, uh, back into regulation as well kind of thing. And I hadn't really done that with anybody in six months. Well, well, it you comes did, back it, so it, fast. It came back, but you know, I think the other thing that when you're saying that about your son, oh my gosh, as as um as two men, in our society, we have shut men off from being able to express themselves, and the mm -hmm. fact that you, as his dad, could help him, is that yeah. just like to me means everything. You know, yeah. I just think that is like showing him a skill that he's not going to forget either, Mark. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what that means. Talk about epigenetics. And mm -hmm. and uh, changing right, laying new templates down. I mean, that's passing it forward. That's passing it forward, my friend. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah. So okay, so my next my next assignment for you too is I want more questions on this next topic, and then we'll figure out a time for you to come back okay. because I I think it's an important topic, and I also think that because the holidays, you know, I think just spark people. And you know that there's a lot of sparking going out. You notice that I'm trying not to use the word trigger anymore. I'm using sparking instead. <laughs> but anyway, it's very hard because triggers is so in our language, right? right. Um, exactly. Sparking or set off. Um, but anyway, um, really, I think we should do it. I mean, if you're willing to, to come back on again, sure. let's do part two. Cause I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe how fast the show was going. Oh, so right. fast. I yeah. know. So we'll do and I was trying to be really, you know, I can get I know, real talkative. You know, and I'm I was like, going, no, oh my gosh, I'm going to skip down to that question because we said we would, but I want to do part two <laughs> so that we can get both. I mean, I think this will be important. I don't know if you're willing to come back in December closer to the holidays because I think the holidays are hard times for vets you're and their families. Happy. Okay. I, I do have to go now because nature's calling. Well, no, please go. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us off Facebook and thank you, my dear friends. I hope to okay. see you both. Wonderful. I know I have a chance to see Mark. I don't know when I'm going to be in Syracuse again. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I'd love to come and see you and Sheila again. It would be fun. All right. Blessings. Right. Blessings to you both. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Likewise. Yes.